Welcome to the New Books Network. Good day. Welcome to New Books in History, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. My name is Charles Cotillo of the Royal Historical Society. I'm a host on the channel. And today we are pleased and indeed honored to have with us Professor Sean McMeekin. Professor McMeekin is Professor of European History and Culture at Bard College. He's the author of a good number of well-received books, including The Russian Origins of the First World War, July 1914, and The Russian Revolution, A New History. And today we are discussing his latest book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II, published by Basic Books. Welcome, Professor McMeekin. Um, Well, thank you, Charles. Thank you for having me on. It's a great honor. Professor, what is uh, the thesis of your book? Well, I suppose I'm I'm trying to reinterpret the war in a way. Uh, To some extent, uh, this is an extension of some of the work that I've done on the First World War, um, which I think the historiography has always been focused uh, near exclusively, really, on uh, the role of Germany in the case of the First World War, Imperial Germany, and the Nazi Germany in the Second. Uh, So essentially, I'm trying to say that uh, that Stalin was at least as important a factor, and in fact, in in some ways, it's certainly the Asian War, far more important factor, that is, than than Hitler. Hitler and, and Nazi Germany in determining the course of events, um, you know, which is not to say this is not about apportioning blame or responsibility in some moral sense, but rather trying to interpret events as they transpired from the origins uh, through the course and then uh, on to the consequences of the war that uh, at various phases, of course, uh, the Soviet Union was, was neutral vis-a-vis either the European war or the war in Asia, um, but always with an eye on the main chance on um, that is, on, on certain long-term policy aims, I think, that, that Stalin and, and Soviet diplomats have been pursuing. And then ultimately, they were, in fact, uh, rather successful. But uh, it, if it's Stalin's war it, uh, uh, at the beginning, it certainly is at the end, uh, that is to say, with the outcome of the war, that Stalin is, is the key victor of the war, both in terms of, of territory conquered and, and booty absorbed, and, um, and in terms of uh, the imposition of, of Soviet communism on, uh, across a broader and broader spectrum of the map of Eurasia. Why do you claim that the Second World War can be uh, described as, quote, the war that Stalin wanted, unquote. Well, if you look at uh, the lead up to the war, there's a lot of debate and discussion about matters such as collective security in the late 1930s. There's a whole sort of a trope of literature blaming the West for uh, for not, not either trusting or, or putting any faith in Stalin, that is to arrange some type of... Uh, uh, collective security alliance against against Hitler. Um, basically, my reading of the evidence suggests that this is this is projection, if not fantasy, on the part of a lot of diplomatic historians. That is to say, that that Stalin never shared that aim. Uh, perhaps uh, Litvinov, who for a time was foreign affairs commissar, he certainly talked the talk about collective security, but there's no evidence that Stalin himself ever really believed in it or saw the world in the same way as as a well-meaning Western liberal, socialist, centrist politics and statesmen and so on, rather that, that Stalin, to some extent, there was an element of paranoia. Stalin thought that the Western powers were trying to maneuver Hitler into war against him, understandably so, in view of, of Hitler's uh, long-term discussion, things like Lemons around in the East. There was always a lot of uh, fear of uh, uh, German ambitions vis-a-vis the Ukraine, and that was certainly in the air, something people were talking about in the 1930s. Um, but what I'm saying isn't really that complicated, and I'm, I'm, in, a, in a way I'm surprised it has been quite as controversial as it has been, at least to some to some reviewers. That is to say that, that Stalin preferred quite simply that Hitler go to war with the Western powers, that is that they would effectively try to uh, destroy each other in a war of attrition akin to the First World War. And uh, this, this is a theme that you see, it's, it's replete in the literature and the documents and, and the statements of uh, not just Stalin, but all kinds of uh, Soviet leaders from Lenin on forward. Even at times, Litvinov talked this way, despite his kind of uh, chatter about collective security. He also made it clear that the Soviets did not want to be maneuvered into a war, rather that what, what Stalin was hoping for was a war that would pit uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany against the Western powers. Um, and in the end, he achieved this quite quite cleverly and almost brilliantly uh, with uh, the signing of, of what we usually call the Molotov-Rippendorf Pact, more accurately, Moscow Pact, on August 23rd, 1939. Um, what was clear at that point was that uh, because 
negotiations were at, at, a, at an impasse between Germany and Poland and all signs were pointing to war. Um, Hitler, of course, did not want to face a two-front war of the kind he had faced in, in, in the First World War, the kind Germ- Germany had faced. And so he was certainly interested in possibly quieting down the Soviet front. But in the end, it really was up to Stalin. Um, that is to say, had Stalin not cut a deal with Hitler, then Hitler would have either been trapped, he would have either had to negotiate some type of compromise deal with uh, with Poland. Um, there's even a possibility, I mean, this isn't something that I'm necessarily qualified to judge, I'm, I'm not necessarily an expert on the German resistance, but there were always, obviously, German generals who were opposed to Hitler, and he had gotten away with his gambles, both at, at uh, Munich and with the Anschluss, and in early, earlier in 1939 with the move into Prague. Um, but the Germans really would have been in a pickle at best, if not in an, in an, in an ultimate nightmare scenario. Um, now, Stalin, of course, could have uh, signed a deal with France and Britain. And this is what, what everyone's always said. Well, if only France and Britain had trusted him or sent a slightly higher level, more serious mission to Moscow, then, then maybe they could have cut a deal. I don't think that was particularly realistic uh, for a number of reasons, first of which is that is that the Soviet Union had ongoing border disputes with countries like Poland and Romania. And effectively, what Stalin wanted in exchange for any type of deal with the West was effectively permission to invade Poland and Romania and, and probably adjust those borders. Um, there also, of course, was no way that, that Stalin could intervene directly against Nazi Germany without going, uh, without that is Red Army troops uh, transiting either Polish or Romanian territory. And so effectively, and this was true even of the Czechoslovak crisis of 38 as well, there's no actual border between the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. So, so the, the idea of a collective security deal in, in geographic terms simply didn't make sense. Um, now, had Stalin really been interested in some type of a modus vivendi with the West and collective security, he certainly could have cut a deal of some kind and, and perhaps negotiated terms with, uh, with Poland and Romania. But not only do I think that would have been difficult, um, um, but I think that in the end, uh, Stalin chose not to do that quite consciously because it was not in the Soviet interest to do so. Uh, rather, he had his own territorial ambitions, and those were much more easily achieved uh, by cutting a deal with Hitler. In the beginning of the book, you concentrate on Stalin's verbal intervention at a ceremony at the Soviet Military Academy on the 5th of May, 1941. Why so? Well, this this ceremony um, has long been kind of rumored, that is to say, we've always known he gave some kind of a speech, and there were a lot of rumors about what exactly he said in the speech, because effectively the intervention, which is now somewhat notorious, um, uh, speaker, a kind of lieutenant general, after, after Stalin's introductory remarks, which actually did go on, on for, for a very long time, uh, Stalin had sat down, and, and effectively they were back to the kind of almost just bromides about the Soviet peace policy, that is, the communiques that the Soviet Union was a peace-loving empire, was, was neutral and staying out of the imperialist war. And Stalin apparently stood up and interrupted him and basically said, you know, this is, this is an out-of-date policy, that effectively that peace policy, which was a kind of euphemism for uh, the opportunistic agreement with Nazi Germany, which had allowed the Soviet Union to invade uh, six, or depending on your count, if you count Manchuria, seven different countries since August 1939, uh, that this period effectively was over, that, that the Soviets had already gained whatever kind of uh, cheap territories, uh, you know, cheap in the pocket that they, they'd been able to do in the slip, slipstream of, of Hitler's own uh, rewriting of, of the European map. Uh, so this intervention marks a certain moment when uh, the talk of a shift to the offensive, and, and you can see it at the very least in the instructions given out to the, the commissars in the army, that is, that they're, they're stepping up their kind of instruction in the army, that now it's all about preaching the offensive and going on the attack. And in the Soviet military plan uh, of, of May uh, 15, 1941, for the first time, there is actually the talk of, if not literally preemption, then the talk of what uh, the idea of kind of forestalling the adversary or, or perhaps interrupting the adversary in the course of attacking. It's not entirely clear from the language what exactly the expectation is, but there's definitely a lot more talk of the offensive. And it happens to match. Uh, Soviet deployment. I mean, we now have uh, much more information at hand than we did uh, before the fall of the Soviet Union as far as uh, archival data um, that is regarding uh, this 
extremely offensive Soviet deployment of everything from, from tanks and armor and petrol stations to, in particular, aerodromes, as they call them, or air bases, um, nearly all of which in early 1941, about 80 percent of the 251 aerodromes are being built uh, in the newly occupied frontier districts, that is, those had, that had been occupied since 1939, uh, abutting, that is, bordering the German Reich. Uh, so the speech is kind of significant, I think, both in that it marks a certain shift in in doctrine, in thinking about warfare, but also because, in fact, you know, if it were just this, this random intervention, it wouldn't actually be that significant, but it does actually match what we know about the Soviet deployment pattern as well. Would it be correct to say that from your perspective, Stalin's industrialization drive of the early 30s was mainly a military rather than an economic project? Oh, I think it was not not exclusively military in nature. I mean, obviously, there's this kind of a second order effect where, you know, you have to start building up heavy industry in some sectors and then move on uh, to the next stage where you are uh, building more trunk, uh, trucks and tanks and warplanes and so on. I mean, obviously, they're building tractors, too. It's not that they're building only weapons. Uh, but as far as the ultimate intent of it, I, I don't think there's really a- any ambiguity. I mean, from from the statements, you know, they see themselves as, as this kind of uh, beleaguered socialist or communist country, which is surrounded by enemies. Uh, there is the ultimate struggle coming with the capitalist world, and they, they need to be prepared. They're 50 years behind. They have to catch up in 10. Um, the, even the kind of the language of the industrialization drive, you know, it's all about mobilization. They're kind of spies and enemies of the people. That is, they're kind of rooting out traitors in their midst. The, the language, the intent of it as far as what they're actually prioritizing and building. And, and then you can just see it in, in, in the materiel that they come up with by the, by the late 30s and early 40s. You know, they're, they're building such a colossal quantity of things like tanks and warplanes and even submarines, believe it or not, uh, that they're simply in another league. I mean, it may not be in terms of, of quality necessarily or, or in terms of the competence of uh, the, the pilots, for example, uh, as compared to, let's say, the pilots of, of the Luftwaffe or the Royal Air Force. But in terms of quantity, uh, that is the raw size of, of uh, uh, the mechanized forces of the Soviet Army and the Soviet Air Force. They're, they're, in, their, they're in their own league. I mean, they're, they're, there's all kinds of evidence of this. You can see in something like even the, the soviet Finnish War, which of uh, 39-40, which a lot of people see as almost this kind of sideshow in the First World War, that uh, the Soviets actually deployed uh, more warplanes overhead over the skies of Finland uh, than did uh, uh, the British and the Germans combined. In, in the entirety of the Battle of Britain. Um, and this isn't even to, you know, to count for things like uh, tanks where the Soviets are simply in their own league, you know, where they're, they're dwarfing the size of, let's say, the German tank park by a factor of, again, depending on the date and, and the campaign you're talking about, by somewhere between uh, five and eight to one. Uh, they're simply in their own league, and, and I don't think it was an accident. Why did President Roosevelt negotiate the recognition of the Soviet Union so poorly in terms of protecting American interests? Well, that's a very good question. Um, he certainly had uh, good information at his disposal. Um, he had many advisors, particularly from the State Department, who had great experience of dealing with the Soviet Union, and so they knew about things like the debt question, uh, the, the defaults on, on the old Tsarist Russian debts, and on uh, property held inside Russia, where American bond and property holders were owed some vast sum of money, again, if you adjusted for, for interest, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 or 600 million. Which was which was a huge amount of money in the early 1930s, and you know maybe Roosevelt he certainly wasn't he didn't display a great interest in that question. Um, I think in the end he seemed to think that um, that if the U.S. did recognize the Soviet Union, that it would open up a lot of business and perhaps investment opportunities for American firms, and probably he was hoping that it would somehow stimulate employment. I think this is somewhat similar to. Uh, the thinking of, of Lloyd George in Britain, if you go back a, a decade or so earlier, first with the Anglo-Soviet Accord of March 21 and then British recognition of the Soviet Union in 1924, which to some extent was a formality by then because of the de facto recognition of the Anglo-Soviet Accord. In both cases, you had an economy which was kind of recovering from a recession or in the U- U.S. case was actually still deep in the depression in the early 30s. And so there's this kind of idea that if you break the ice, as Roosevelt put it, uh, you'll open up all kinds of opportunities for for trade. I think what he didn't understand, aside from how much leverage he had on the question of uh, the default, he also had uh, leverage in the sense that uh, it really wasn't a matter of the Soviets 
not wanting U.S. investment. There were plenty of U.S. firms already operating in, in the Soviet Union. In fact, many of them were, were deeply involved in, in helping to design some of the factories and um, metallurgical plants of the Soviet industrial drive. Just the Soviets didn't have money to pay for it. And I think that's what Roosevelt really didn't understand. Um, I, I think in the end, he was maybe a little bit naive and he probably listened to advice uh, from the wrong people. Is it not the case that you agree with George uh, Kennan's uh, contention that uh, the State Department's East European East European Division was in essence destroyed uh, by virtue of Kremlin influence. Well, I mean, I don't know if de- destroyed is the word. Um, it was uh, gravely undermined at the very least. I mean, you did have that purge in 1937 where they also kind of uh, redistributed the resources of, of the library, which included uh, all kinds of of very revealing uh, documentation, including even editions of some of the Soviet newspapers going all the way back to 1917, and they kind of broke up the East European division. Um, And then there was another purge conducted in 1943. Um, And I I don't think either of those purges were accidental. I think in in both cases, it was quite clearly that uh, Stalin and, of course, his advisors, his diplomats and so on, were to some extent even some of the spies or agents of influence were behind it. But I don't think it was necessarily even that that much a matter of kind of – Agents burrowed deep inside the State Department. I think it was actually ordered from on high. Um, I mean, in 1937, it was quite clear that, that Stalin and, and, in fact, U.S. Ambassador Joseph Davis talked openly about this. And Davis basically said to, to Stalin, "Look, there, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, as he might have called them, kind of anti-Soviet, incorrigible anti-Soviet types in Washington, and we don't want them to get the president's ear." And uh, this message uh, made it back to the White House, um, and um, and in the end. Um, uh, the purge was conducted really kind of almost just right under the nose of, uh, you know, of the president. Um, and then something very similar happened in 1943. There's also kind of the, the different political dynamic where you have the vast Lend-Lease program and anyone who kind of either slights it or criticizes it is going to be accused of being anti-Russian or of wanting to bleed the Russians dry or something like that. And so the political dynamic was a little different uh, in 1943 to 1937. But no, I think Kennan was, was definitely right about that. And I mean, Kennan and, and Chip Bowen and many others who had experience of the Soviet Union, I think they were increasingly aghast at the way that the people who really understood the country were being sidelined. Who took the first step in negotiations that led to the non-aggression pact, Germany or the Soviet Union? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, there, there are definitely steps being taken by both sides. Um, in some ways, I think it was Stalin who really kind of got the ball rolling first, even if maybe he didn't make the decisive moves regarding um, proposals uh, for what would become the pact. You can go back to his uh, the, what I call the chestnut speech of March 39, Party Congress, where he talks about how uh, the Soviet Union is not going to basically allow itself to be maneuvered into war by the Western powers, uh, you know, like others to pull the chestnuts out of the fire for them. The Germans later actually saw this speech, or at least retrospectively, they, they say this in Moscow in August 39, they saw this as kind of a gesture. But no, I think it was actually Stalin's purge of Litvinov and frankly, the vast majority of the Jewish employees uh, from the Soviet Commissary to Foreign Affairs um, in early May 1939. I mean, this was so clearly a signal that um, Hitler immediately actually tells Goebbels to uh, to change the the entire sort of makeup of, of uh, German propaganda, to, to stop attacking the Soviet Union uh, and await further developments. It's, it's clearly a signal that, that Stalin is interested in negotiations at the very least. It uh, wasn't clear yet what kind of a deal would be reached. Um, you know, after that, it goes back and forth a little bit with trade proposals. The Soviets kind of play hard to get a little bit, make sure that they can ratchet up their own demands and terms. But I do think the initial move was made uh, by the Soviets. Um, and they ended up with, um, you know, basically because they had superior leverage because Hitler's military timetable was quite strict. If he, if he did one with big Poland that summer, in the end, the Soviets, I think, got, got a much better deal out of it. Um, but I do think it was Stalin who actually made the first move. Why, in fact, do you think that uh, Stalin negotiated a better deal for the Soviet Union than Hitler did for Germany? Well, I think, uh, again, he had the superior leverage. Um, the Germans needed a deal more pressingly than Stalin did. Uh, Stalin had no immediate plans for any type of military offensive, uh, at least not in Europe. I mean, he was his armies were engaged against Japan in August and September 1939, but he had no immediate kind of pressing timetable in Europe, um, and so that gave him superior leverage. Now, as far as, as the deal that was negotiated, um, uh, it certainly did help the Germans in the sense that, aside from uh, making sure they didn't have to worry about uh, 
the eastern flank of Poland, that is the Soviets coming in from the other side in a hostile sense. Uh, they also had a way of circumventing the British blockade, uh, which had ultimately helped to doom Germany in, in the First World War, um, basically by granting access to Soviet resources, uh, things such as oil, uh, manganese, uh, cotton, and even some rubber coming in through transshipments from Asia, the kind of things that the Germans really wouldn't be able to import because of the British blockade. Um, so all that certainly helped the Germans. It's not that they got nothing out of the deal, but if you look at the, the kind of the territory swapping, uh, the Soviets, uh, they got two of the three Baltic states, and then they got all three of them because the Germans overstepped the demarcation lines because the Soviets did it in delayed so long before invading themselves, so they had to swap central Poland for Lithuania. Um, but Stalin also had a free hand, effectively, in Finland um, and in Romania. Um, and effectively, uh, the Germans were really kind of doing the bulk of uh, the hard work, that is, in destroying Poland's armies. The Soviets were given, in fact, a larger share of Polish territory than the Germans, even though the Germans were expected to do a lion's share of damage against the Polish armies. Um, and meanwhile, Stalin, and, and here's the thing the Germans maybe didn't initially understand, Stalin could pose as a neutral. So here, here's the, the biggest difference of all, of course, is that Britain and France declare war on Germany, but not on the Soviet Union, even though they both invaded Poland. Um, now, Stalin maybe wasn't quite sure that would happen, but Molotov in particular massaged that brilliantly by uh, camouflaging the Soviet military posture, by delaying before the Soviets invaded. Even when they invaded, they pretended they weren't invading. They said it was a protection mission. They said, we're just going to wait until uh, Poland basically gives up the ghost, and then we're just going to come in and protect our our beleaguered Belarusian and Ukrainian brothers, as he put it. Um, and then on top of that, when, when they negotiated this, this swap, um, because the Germans had overstepped the, the demarcation line in central Poland, um, the Soviets gave up a lot of central Poland in exchange for Lithuania. This then allowed Molotov and Stalin to pose as if all they had really done was return the Soviet borders to the old Curzon line favored by the British and the Western Allies back in 1919-1920. It wasn't actually the Curzon line, but it sort of approximated it enough that uh, Western apologists could say, well, look, the Soviets didn't really invade Poland. They just kind of recovered their lost territory. Um, so in all of those ways, um, Stalin got a much better deal out of it uh, than Hitler did. And I mean, of course, the, the biggest part was that Hitler was at war with the Western powers. Now, admittedly, they didn't do very much. And they did almost nothing for the first six or seven months uh, of the war, um, but Stalin was neutral, and he could sit back and, and watch as, as he hoped Hitler and the Western powers would destroy each other. How close were the Allies in March of 1940 to intervening in the Russo-Finnish War, and why did it not come off? Well, I do think they were fairly close. Uh, Stalin certainly thought they were. Um, this is a subject which, of course, has, has come up in a lot of the kind of the discussion of the book, and so we proposed that I have uh, uh, that I've concocted some sort of a, uh, a counterfactual about this. I don't actually think it's a counterfactual. Um, I do think that the Allies were planning to intervene. At the very least, the staffs had been ordered to make plans for intervention. The British ordered, for example, four squadrons of Blenheim bombers to Iraq. They carried out the surveillance overflights of Baku and Batumi, which would seem to be unrelated to Finland, except that. Uh, the best way of really damaging the Soviet and also the German war effort would have been to knock out the oil installations of Baku. And it's quite clear from the Allied planning documents, the extensive chatter about the subject, um, how serious they were about this. And also from uh, the way Stalin, of course, reacted. Uh, he had uh, informants, high-level informants in uh, the French Middle Eastern Command, in terms under General Wagon. Um, he had high-level informants in London as well inside the British government. And so he knew all about these plans. In fact, he even instigated queries at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow about the likely damage from uh, a bombing campaign against uh, the oil fields and oil derricks of, of Baku and was given actually a very pessimistic estimate uh, because the derricks were so kind of closely placed apart. The way they were spread apart, it actually did not require the bombers to be particularly accurate. Uh, uh, and I, I do think that uh, in the end, Stalin uh, forestalled this intervention precisely because he was so terrified of it happening, because it did seem to be right on the cusp. There were also, um, as far as amphibious forces, now it's true the British favored uh, a Norwegian campaign, and this is when Churchill was in charge of the Admiralty and he was in charge of planning, and they called that one Catherine, uh, the other version where they might have either gone to Finland and then also carried out the bombing campaign. Um, 
uh, the, the bombing campaign part was called uh, Operation Pike. Uh, now, Churchill had definitely favored the Norwegian operation over landing in Finland. The French favored the Finnish operation, but they didn't actually have uh, the naval carrying capacity and, and the transports, and they were to some extent in British mercy. But there the, the objective would have been to land troops at Pitsamo in the far north, which is where a lot of the nickel supplies were. Now, there was this dual angle here where the nickel of Pitsamo and also the iron ore coming from uh, the Galavere mines, uh, they were also, of course, extremely important for, for the German Wehrmacht, for the production of Panzers in particular. And so the Allies thought they could strike a kind of dual blow against both Hitler and Stalin here. And there was at least talk, at least in, in the French uh, planning documents, of, of, of an echelon. And the first echelon was to land in Finland on March 12th. Now, it may simply be a coincidence that that's the date, March 12th, 1940, that Stalin uh, signed his armistice, leading to a, a kind of a peremptory and rather quickie peace treaty with Finland. I don't think it was entirely a coincidence. Uh, and one week before that, March 5th, is also the date uh, that, that Beria ordered, of course, on Stalin's behalf, uh, the rounding up of uh, the vast number of Polish officers, merchants, elites, and so on for, for mass execution, that we usually call the Katyn Force Massacre. And again, it might seem unconnected, but in fact, uh, there were many Poles in Britain training in the RAF, um, also training for a possible expeditionary deployment in Scandinavia, and there was even some talk of Polish troops being airlifted into the Caucasus. Uh, now, was Stalin excessively paranoid in the sense that uh, the Allies during this phony war period were always slightly indecisive in general, and in particular Chamberlain was kind of hesitant to give the final, the final go-ahead? Sure, maybe Stalin was excessively paranoid, and maybe the Allies were quite as close as Stalin thought to declaring war on him. But to me, the really interesting question, although there is potentially a counterfactual about what might have happened if the Allies intervened. The really interesting uh, part of this story to me is its impact on, on Stalin's decision-making. Stalin made a peace treaty with Finland. I think that was a, an absolutely brilliant move. It was unexpected. Um, and then, of course, also Stalin carried out his vengeance against uh, the Polish officers, merchants, and elites, uh, killing nearly 23,000 of them by execution. There were also deportations alongside that of tens of thousands more Polish nationals, including many Polish Jews. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, a tragic, in some ways a missed opportunity, but also a story which had uh, tragic consequences uh, for many of uh, uh, the unfortunate war prisoners that Stalin had taken in uh, from his own long neglected and forgotten invasion of Poland in 1939. What was the Soviet reaction to the German military victories in the spring of 1940? Well, it's interesting. It uh, depends on which ones you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about the German victories in Denmark and Norway, uh, it, was, it was bordering on glue because up until that point, in fact, uh, the Soviets had been worried about uh, the Anglo-French military intervention we were just talking about, whether in terms of some sort of amphibious landing in Scandinavia, even possibly in Norway, but which might give them bases within striking range of Murmansk and perhaps Petsamo, then still under Soviet control in the far north. Uh, that is, they'd been terrified of this kind of almost bogey of Allied intervention. And, and again, Stalin still had this idea about the British, that they were, of course, the leading imperial power, the leading naval power. He knew that Britain had intervened in the Russian Civil War, both in the Baltic and even briefly in 1918 in Baku, the so-called Dumpster Force mission. Uh, so Stalin, you know, again, perhaps he exaggerated British capacities in Elon, but he was genuinely terrified of some sort of British operation against him. Um, and when the Germans uh, beat the British to the punch in Norway and effectively humiliated the British, even if they, they hung a little bit up in, in Nordic, for the most part, the campaign was over rather swiftly in a couple of days in April. Um, the Soviets were immensely relieved. In fact, they had been a little bit annoyed with the Germans during the Finnish war. They knew that a lot of German public opinion sympathized with and supported the Finns. There were some rumors even of, of the Germans kind of quietly supporting Finland, at least politically behind the scenes. And the Germans had even offered to mediate, and Stalin was really annoyed by that. So the, the Soviets had even begun to kind of slow walk uh, some of the processing of German nationals who were supposed to be allowed, that is, from, from Soviet custody, uh, from, uh, from basically the, the, the carve-up of Poland in 1939. They were slow walking the processing. They were slow-walking deliveries of oil and other resources. Uh, so regarding the German victories in Denmark and Norway, again, it's, it's almost gleeful. The Soviets suddenly, it's like a, a, a switch is flipped. 
and they suddenly agree to every German demand, and they start shipping them whatever they need, which is actually significant because the oil shipments ramp up in May and June 1940 as the Germans invade low countries. You know, an invasion uh, supplied to the tune of perhaps as much as 30 or 40 percent as far as uh, the petrol actually from Soviet imports, uh, which are being ramped up uh, to a very high level. Um, now, initially, when, when uh, Molotov and Stalin learn about the invasion of France of the Low Countries, uh, they're, they're nearly as gleeful because, to some extent, this is kind of this long delayed event that they had hoped that they had been precipitating the previous fall. They, they had hoped that Hitler and the Western powers would go to war. So far, they hadn't really done much fighting, and the Soviets had really done, in fact, even more fighting in a way than Finland. Um, they are, however, slightly taken aback and in the end a little bit alarmed at how quickly the Germans seemed to be winning because that was not really what Stalin had hoped for. Um, they do, however, on the surface and diplomatically, they support it. They tell the French Communist Party to basically invite in the Germans and not to resist. And this is the official message of the French Communist Party. A lot of French communists, those with kind of even some patriotism, tear up their party cards in disgust, but officially the the Soviets are quite supportive of the German invasion of France and the Low Countries. Um, but because it does happen more quickly than that is the German victories than, than Stalin and Molotov, of course, hoped for or wanted, um, they do have to speed up their own timetable for some of the moves they've been planning to make anyway, such as the full-on occupation of the Baltic states, which they carry out basically against the kind of the smokescreen of, uh, of the fall of Paris. 1940, and then they also make their move into Romania. Um, they feel like they have to do those things quickly because they're afraid, of course, that Hitler is going to is going to be able to turn his forces around uh, back to the east. Temporarily, however, East Prussia is largely undefended in summer of 1940. There's even a little bit of chatter that that Hitler and, and this is something that, that Churchill, of course, is hoping for. Hitler and Stalin would break with one another, and that maybe the Soviets will. Um, uh, turn on their ally while the Germans were, were vulnerable. No, instead, Stalin was reasonably true to his alliance. He just made some opportunistic moves while the Germans were busy in the West. Uh, but he would have preferred that they'd stayed busy in the West for much longer and, of course, lost a lot more armor and, and manpower than they did. What caused Molotov's visit to Berlin in November 1940? And why did it not succeed in resolving the tensions between Berlin and Moscow? Well, the tensions really were growing by the fall of 1940. Um, I mean, some of it was just this, this sense of almost annoyance, I think, that, that, that Hitler and Ribbentrop were increasingly feeling, but particularly Hitler, that the Germans were actually carrying out these uh, decisive and significant military campaigns against relatively formidable opponents. And the Soviets were almost using this, um, you know, a little bit like a jumped up Mussolini. But Stalin was making these opportunistic moves on the map. Uh, places like Finland, the Baltic states, and Romania. But Romania was much more serious. Um, I think the showdown really had to do with the Balkans. Um, that is, the Soviet move there, and they went beyond what had been promised to them in the molotov ribbentrop or moscow Pact of August 39, which had spoken a little bit vaguely, but it had certainly alluded to the province then known as Bessarabia or Bessarabia kind of down uh, much of what is now uh, Moldova abutting the kind of the Black Sea coast going down towards the Danube Delta. A little bit further inland um, was um, the province of Bukovina, and uh, this had not been mentioned at all in the pact or really in any German-Soviet negotiations prior to uh, late June 1940, when Molotov started sort of pushing this on the Germans, almost just trying to see what he could get away with. Um, and in the end, they, they, they came up with a compromise. The Soviets could effectively invade and occupy the northern half of Bukovina so long as they agree to effectively a kind of German military penetration of Romania, just insofar as protecting the oil resources there. Um, the oil of Romania was, uh, at least in percent, even more significant for the German war machine than the oil coming from the Caucasus. So again, the oil from the Caucasus made up perhaps about a third of what the Germans uh, were reliant on by 1940. The oil from Romania and Romanian refineries was actually about half. So effectively, what you're looking at as far as uh, German kind of economic dependence on the Soviets um, is that although a lot of the Romanian oil, again, was not an immediate Soviet control, it actually had to transit now to Soviet-controlled territory to reach the Reich. And this is true of all of the oil, of course, coming from the Caucasus. So effectively, Stalin has, at least potentially at least, if he decides to cut off the spigot, he has control over more than 80% of Hitler's available natural oil resources. Um, and in addition to oil, there were also the kind of non-ferrous metals and particularly the chrome 
chromium, which was coming in from the Balkans and then from Turkey, something like 5,500 tons in all that the Germans were uh, reliant on. Uh, that is, this is like the regular inflow that the Germans are relying on, particularly in the production of things like panzers and really uh, any kind of mechanized armor. Um, and so all of these resources are now effectively kind of at, at, at Stalin's mercy because he can now, partly because of his moves in the Balkans and, and because of his overall leverage over the Germans uh, vis-a-vis Soviet resources, uh, they have immense immense leverage over the Germans. Um, now, had they simply allowed this to transpire and not really threaten the Germans in any way, it wouldn't necessarily have gotten to be as serious as it was in fall of 1940. But, in fact, the Soviets were making aggressive forward moves, as were the Germans. Of course, the Germans are beginning to move uh, troops into Romania. The Germans are hoping, at least, to have some control over some of the resources in Finland as well, in Petsamo, and, and the Soviets are making moves there. So there's a lot of tension in Finland, particularly over uh, nickel, which the Germans needed in Panzer production. Uh, there's huge tension over Romania. Um, and the Soviets, in fact, are, are even looking further south in the Balkans. They're beginning to look at Bulgaria and the Turkish Straits as well. Um, the real kind of crunch was happening in Romania, though, the Danube Delta, and there are all kinds of slightly complex negotiations regarding things like riverine and seaborne vessels and control of the Delta. Um, the Soviets and the Romanians are already in kind of these, these border skirmishes on some of the islands in the Delta. It's, it's getting to be quite serious. Um, and so the Germans and Soviets, again, they're, they're kind of, they're no longer quite seeing eye to eye. The other thing, of course, is they now have this, uh, this direct frontier, which they had not had in 1939, you know, which is more than a thousand miles long, bris- bristling with sentries and spies. Um, so there's a lot of just direct tension in that sense. Um, now, Hitler was also, in, curiously enough, despite the thumping German military victories in the West, uh, he was still in a deeply vulnerable position, um, not just because of the British blockade. Uh, the U.S. was to some extent now helping Britain indirectly, although still neutral in the war. Um, the Germans, uh, and, and this is interesting in the way that they're trying to massage this vis-a-vis Hitler, you know, they, they do an updating of what had been called the anti comintern Pact between the Texas powers with Italy and Japan, and they, they, they call this the tripartite pact. Uh, that is to say, it's no longer directed against communism, rather it's directed against Britain and the United States, the Anglo-Saxon powers, as they call them. So the idea is that these are the three kind of upstarts who were trying to topple the, the Anglo-Saxon imperium, and, and Hitler effectively invites Stalin to join this, and that's, that's the, the immediate order of business in Berlin. It's this kind of almost German invitation to join the tripartite pact in terms of some type of quadrilateral or four-power pact. Um, and, I mean, what happens is, in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, Stalin effectively lays down almost an ultimatum. I mean, if you, know, if you want to maintain these relations and invite us into your, your kind of anti-Anglo uh, sub Stalin says, then you need to withdraw your troops from Romania and Finland, and you need to give us the right to invade and occupy Bulgaria and, and also Turkish territory vis-a-vis the Turkish Straits. Um, they're both, to some extent reacting against Britain still. Uh, the Germans say, you know, they, they basically need uh, to protect the Balkans against against the British and bombing raids, and the Soviets need to protect the Straits against uh, the Royal Navy. So to some extent, they're both supposedly reacting against the British, but they're increasingly, I think, seeing one another as opponents now, uh, particularly in the Balkans. What do you make of the Suvorov thesis? Well, it's interesting. I mean, when that came out, uh, I think Western audiences were first experienced Exposed to this in the translated version of the one of the book they called Icebreaker in about 1990. Um, I mean, what's interesting is that you know initially it got a lot of attention and it was a bestseller and, and a lot of kind of military history buffs started talking about it and debating it. When the specialist historians in the West started chiming in, of course they dismissed this as a fantasy. Uh, it's Gabriel Gorodetsky who wrote a big book called Grand Delusion, and um, David Glantz, a specialist historian of the Eastern Front, he did n- a number of books. Uh, stumbling Colossus was one of them where they're essentially trying to kind of dismantle the theory. Um, I, I'm not sure if they really took it quite seriously enough, though, in terms of actually developing new evidence. Um, I mean, Glantz is someone who's done dozens of these specialized studies of campaigns in the Eastern Front, and they're all exceptionally detailed at the granular level. If you ever look at his sources, though, uh, you'll see that while he does have a lot of Soviet sources, they're all effectively kind of approved sources. You know, they're all either government uh, published or at the very least kind of uh, curated uh, collections of, of official documentary material. 
um, unauthorized for it in the Soviet archives, of course, were not even possible until 1991. And in fact, historians, above all, Russian historians, began looking into the Suvorov thesis back in the early and they've continued doing so on for the next 20 or 30 years. I mean, a really amazing collection of new archival material was published in Russia beginning in 1998 called uh, uh, the year 1941 documents is normally how it would be trans- translated into English, but it's never been translated into English. And in fact, there are other document collections, too. That's probably the most important of them, along with all these specialized studies of the Soviet military posture, of the deployment pattern, even of some of the kind of you know, the secret meetings and so on that were held. All of this stuff has been pouring out of Russia now for two or three decades. But because it hasn't been translated, most Western historians simply have dismissed it or haven't paid attention. There are a few exceptions, of course. Uh, I mean, among what you might call mainstream military historians, um, Evan Maudsley has taken it quite seriously in his book, uh, Thunder in the East. Um, you know, he doesn't take, he doesn't tackle the kind of the thesis directly, but he does take seriously the idea that the Soviets were actually becoming much more offensive in their, in their deployment pattern and their kind of, in their doctrine and the way they were discussing and preparing and planning for war. Um, you know, so that I think that the thesis itself, in part because Suvorov by then had no access to Soviet archives, so a lot of it's kind of conjecture and, and speculation. Uh, it's surprising how many things he got right, though, that is based on what we now know about uh, the deployment pattern based on uh, a lot of new documentation. Now, my own view in the end, it, it's somewhat equivocal. That is to say, I do think the Soviets uh, were carrying out this extremely, almost lopsidedly offensive deployment pattern in the first six months of 1941. Uh, one doesn't know what the intention was. That is to say, uh, were they hoping, and in fact, you can see this in the kind of the the discussions, uh, the transcripts we now have of some of the military plans that they're still talking about the ideas that they're hoping that the Germans will sort of telegraph a punch, so to speak, with a with a large scale mobilization, but that the Soviets will have almost a grace period to respond, almost like it was still 19, just a little bit wishful, like it's still 1914. And everyone is worried about a kind of mobilization day plus four that the Germans will need and that the Soviets will have time to counterattack, whereas the the, the key phrase which keeps coming up in the Soviet documents is a powerful strike in the direction of Lublin, that is the Polish city. This is coming from the southwestern front or from western Ukraine. And that is where most of the armor was being concentrated, along with most of uh, the resources, uh, the light bombers, the fighters, etc. cetera, and the Soviet Air Force was on the southwestern front, uh, the Ukrainian front. Um, and again, this could be, you could make the argument, well, this is because it was planning to invade Ukraine. But, but in fact, of course, the Germans were actually planning the bulk of their offensive further north um, on the central front, um, and the Soviet deployment pattern was not defensive. You know, there, there's not a lot of kind of um, barbed wire fortifications going up. Rather, they're building roads and tank parks, and you know, they're building new air bases close to the frontier. To me, the most interesting evidence, and some that I actually did find myself, it's not that difficult to find, in fact, because it's right in the main Argaspi, or as I usually call it in shorthand, the Communist Party Archive in Moscow, uh, they now give you out um, uh, what they call the special files of the Politburo, uh, which don't necessarily have the transcript of every conversation, but they have all the key resolutions passed and uh, the key directives and stipulations that are being approved by the Politburo. So that you can see, for example, in, in May and June of 1941, not just the deployment pattern and all the new weapon systems they're spending money on and planning to build, uh, you know, their, their preference for certain types of, of light bombers or the T-34 and the KV tanks, etc. But what you can see is once they, once they do have good evidence that the Germans are getting close to invading, there's a kind of creeping dread or panic that sets in, and they issue these last-minute orders to camouflage all the new air bases and tank parks and aerodromes, which is you know, a little bit like, it's, it's not a confession of offensive intent exactly, but it's a little bit like realizing that they've gotten caught effectively with their pants down. They're, they're in this vastly offensive deployment pattern, but they're not ready for war yet, nor have they even begun. A lot of these new air bases and tank parks don't even have roofs, and they haven't camouflaged them, and they're trying to build all these dummy air bases and dummy warplanes. And the target dates for that kind of Maskirovka or kind of camouflage campaign, they come July 5th, July 15th, July 20th, July 25th, this is 1941. So in every case, of course, it was two or three or four or five weeks too late because the Germans invaded on June 22nd. But the Germans were just faster. You know, they were more dynamic. And uh, whatever the Soviets were planning uh, was effectively uh, ruined uh, by uh, the speed of the German advance. Why do you believe that Hitler's decision in July 1941 
to not have army groups sent to concentrate on Moscow was not necessarily a mistake on his part. Well, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made for momentum and carrying the offensive forward, even though their flanks would have been exposed. And just in kind of your, your raw kind of military analysis terms, in terms of uh, both at the tactical and the strategic level, there's an argument to be made there. And I don't think the argument is entirely hollow. But what Hitler did focus on instead, and, and the reason he called off the attack effectively was to mount these, these other offensives, both on, on the northern front, uh, targeting Leningrad or, or, or Petersburg, as we call it today, and then on the southern front in the Ukraine. Now, both of those, and this is part, part of Hitler's thinking, which was always kind of infused by uh, economic autarky and ideas of the significance of economic resources, the kind of thing that he and his generals often clashed over. Um, the, the, the key factor to me on, 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 on both fronts, really, though, in Ukraine, of course, you're talking about all kinds of resources, you know, everything from, from coal and iron um, to manganese, um, but in particular, bauxite and aluminum. And it was the bauxite that was located uh, near Tikvin um, on the front uh, that is abutting Leningrad, actually they ended up a little bit even to, uh, uh, to the east of Leningrad, south and Leningrad. Um, and then down in Ukraine, it was uh, around near Zaporozhye. They were trying to knock out uh, effectively Stalin's aluminum production complex. Um, and aluminum was hugely important for all the belligerent countries because in that era, that's, that's what you needed to build airplanes because of the kind of uh, uh, the strength to weight ratio. Um, but the Soviets also used it in their tanks. So they needed it for everything. They needed it for the T-34 and the KV tanks, and they needed it for their airplanes. And in the end, the Germans actually succeeded in knocking out about 60% of Stalin's uh, aluminum production, which is one of the reasons he was so desperate to get uh, aluminum, among many other things, uh, from um, from Britain and the United States. Um, but so there's an argument to be made there that the Germans are, you know, thinking in terms of it's not a long war. They're thinking in terms of the economic resources that they need to secure. Um, the flip side of this is that Moscow was significant in its own right, economically speaking. It was a huge industrial center, um, and the factories, of course, south of Moscow, Tula, were also hugely important. And so you could flip this around and say that that maybe Hitler should have. Uh, speeded up that advance further. But there, there's yet another angle, though, where to, to mount the final push, I think the Germans also wanted to finish double-tracking, uh, that is, uh, expanding the gauge of the Russian line uh, as they're moving into Belarusia, because the Russian gauge was wider and broader than the European one. And so in order for the supplies to uh, to be able to be brought in by rail for any major offensive, uh, they also needed to finish regauging the line. Um, so there were a lot of kind of practical and economic arguments in favor of what Hitler did. So that said, I wouldn't entirely dismiss this argument made by the kind of the, the more purely military historians uh, that the Germans had the Soviets on the run in July and that perhaps they should have pushed on forward that Hitler got a little bit distracted by uh, you know these kind of economic arguments about the deployments in both the northern and the southern front. But I think in the end, these arguments, they all depend on your interpretation of you know, when and how the Germans and again, the, the, the argument among most kind of consensus military historians or in some of the work by uh, David Stahel, for example, is that, well, the Germans never could have won because, you know, they didn't have enough armor. They didn't have enough trucks and transport. And uh, they were too reliant even on, you know, on kind of on horses and oxen. And they just basically they did not have uh, the resources in order to be able to triumph. The problem that I do have with those arguments, they make very good arguments about German limitations, is I don't think they realize quite how desperate the Soviets were in 1941. And that's where you can see it in, in the production of all of the key indices, um, in particular pr production of, of tanks, but also warplanes, everything else, that the Germans, uh, we shouldn't forget, they're also knocking out Soviet production. They're knocking out Soviet uh, industry. They're knocking out Soviet factories. They're knocking out huge vast swathes of land in the Baltic alone, they knocked out the entire uh, production for kind of Red Army boot and uniform supply. Uh, you've got the grain, uh, the kind of uh, the wheat bread basket of Ukraine. In all of those ways, um, the Soviets were on the run and were, they were becoming in economic terms almost just as desperate, if not more so than the Germans uh, by, by late 1941. Um, you know, there were, there were certain factors particularly Lenley Said, which I talk about in a lot of the book that helped so to kind of turn that tide. But the Soviets were quite desperate in 1941 as well. Why do you believe that Harry Hopkins and FDR were so pro-Soviet by way of not asking Stalin for anything by anything in the shape of a quid pro quo for American military aid? Well, that's still a little bit of a mystery. I mean, in, in Roosevelt's case, I think there's, there's almost a kind of a psychological sense, almost a kind of noblesse oblique um, that he had a certain almost um, 
aristocratic worldview, I think, where, I mean, perversely, of course, he also has this, this anti-British streak where he's, he's an anti-imperialist. Um, but on the other hand, I think he views the Soviets as this kind of needy, underprivileged power and that the United States um, effectively was granting these things to them, both out of necessity and out of generosity, and that, and that doing the thing itself was a kind of selfless gesture that appealed, uh, I think, to his sense of uh, of noblesse oblige. Um, in terms of Hopkins, who is far more emphatic and the one who really does have his hand in the policy, I mean, it's really Hopkins' show running the Lend-Lease administration. Um, you know, there's an argument that percolates around and, and comes up periodically about Hopkins. I think it came up even in, in one of Christopher Andrews' books, and there's a certain literature here in the United States about the Venona decrypts and whether it might have been possible that you know, Hopkins might have been some type of a, certainly not a party member. We know he wasn't. Maybe he was an agent of influence of source. I, in the end, think that's kind of a little bit of a semantic argument. That is to say, I, I don't know exactly why Hopkins did what he did. I don't think he was a Communist Party member. I think that's pretty clear. I don't think he took orders from or regularly met with agents of the Soviet government, aside from those that, of course, once Len Lee was running, he just he met with them regularly, just as a matter of course. Um, I simply think he was devoted to the Soviet cause. Um, I think he also, after traveling to Moscow in July 1941, meeting Stalin, being impressed by him, meeting Molotov, I think they probably must have flattered him and made him feel important. And I think Stalin genuinely took a liking to Hopkins. I mean, he, he was genuinely impressed that in, in the course of, of the war, it was maybe a little bit of a lull on the Moscow front when he arrived at the end of July 1941. But still, it was a dangerous trip. And uh, there's a sense in which you know, he also kind of just showed his stripes there that he really was very devoted to the Soviet cause. And it became a little bit of a self-reinforcing thing. The more devoted he became to the Soviet cause, the more the Soviets came to rely on him, which inflated his own sense of kind of substance and that he was doing something heroic. And I think in the end, uh, he simply saw it as his mission. And in fact, he talked quite openly about it. I mean, he would give interviews and talk about how he was you know, the greatest proponent of the Soviet cause in Washington. You know, at one point he says, you know, Marshall's job of the president was to represent the American interest. My job was to represent the interest. And, and he says this quite openly. Um, or I think, that, I'm sorry, that was Marshall who said that, but um, that, you know, Hopkins, he, did, he didn't dispute this, that uh, he, he was quite quite open about this. Um, he wasn't really shy either in, in, in explaining and his own thinking. His own thinking was that the Soviets were going to be the greatest power in Europe at the end of the war. Um, and the U.S. should do everything possible to keep them happy. Um, to stay on their good side. Um, and, you know, to be fair, there is an argument there. I, I don't think it's a very good argument. I mean, I think in the end, the idea that the Soviets would be the greatest power in Europe, I think is something that, that probably should have been taken a little more seriously as, as something potentially to be alarmed about in view of the past history of Soviet behavior and, and Stalin, after all, having allied with Hitler for nearly two years at the beginning of the war. Um, no, I think in the end, I mean, Hopkins came to see this almost as his personal duty, his mission um, to serve the Soviet Union. And again, as to why, um, I think only Hopkins knows. So for you, there was uh, an, an alternative, unlike for historians like um, uh, Robert Dalek and Warren Kimball, who argue that, in fact, there was no alternative. The policy that FDR and Churchill followed vis-a-vis -vis Stalin was the only game in town. Your contention is that's a false um, reading of uh, the situation. Is that correct? Well, there are always alternatives. Um, certainly one has to deal with the constraints of the time. Um, I think given Roosevelt's devotion to the Allied cause, uh, that is given the fact that he was intending at some point to try to bring the United States into war against Nazi Germany, even though the U.S. was still neutral in June and July of 1941. Given that, it certainly would have been difficult for Roosevelt not to take the Soviet side in the war, at least um, rhetorically. Um, as, as far as Lend-Lease aid, again, there the argument is it was both to keep the Soviets in the war, to save at least in this run British lives, later American lives, when the U.S. was in the war. I do think, though, that a lot of those arguments um, suffer from a little bit of a, of a, of, of a post hoc fallacy um, in thinking that the way that things turned out was the only way they could have turned out. If you actually revisit the arguments at the time, again, to go beyond at least Roosevelt's own personal views, uh, 
Uh, it was quite clear there was no majority public support for this policy of giving Lend-Lease aid to the Soviet Union. Uh, Gallup poll in July 1941 made that clear. At least 54% were clearly opposed. Uh, the Roosevelt administration, they actually canvassed public opinion themselves, Hopkins did. They discovered that there was majority support in only 11 out of 48 states, not even in New York State, Roosevelt's home state, for this policy. Um, a number of voices were raised, of course, both in the public and in Congress. Uh, I'll give you just one figure because it was very mainstream in the Democratic Party. Harry Truman, of course, said that on the floor of the Senate, that the U.S. should see how the war goes, and if it looks like Germany's winning, we should we should aid the Soviets, and if it looks like the Soviets are uh, winning, then we should aid the Germans. Now, maybe that was callous, and maybe that type of policy never would have appealed to the public or would have had to have been hushed up or kept quiet. But in fact, the fact that the Lend-Lease policy was controversial was implicitly admitted because the Roosevelt administration did keep it secret. They kept it secret until November 1941. That is, for five months, they kept secret the fact that they were aiding the Red Army. Um, they even gave instructions to U.S. diplomats not to talk about it out loud or in public or in the presence of reporters because they, they were keeping it secret because they had no policy. So, I mean, to, to begin with, no, it was not a policy where there were no other alternatives. Um, even once you decide you are going to give uh, either Lend-Lease aid or some type of military aid to the Soviet Union, um, all kinds of conditions, of course, could have been applied to it. Repayment conditions, uh, quid pro quos regarding even simply access to the front. Um, uh, the U.S. military attaché at the time, uh, Ivan Deaton, uh, wanted at the very least a little bit of access to, to the front, uh, access to information so the Americans could be told how the Soviets were using our equipment. None of that was granted. And that's part of the reason why, to this day, um, a lot of people continue to deny the importance of Lend-Lease aid in the Soviet war effort. A large part of the reason is because the Soviets didn't admit it at the time, and they kept all the information secret, and they didn't let anyone actually go inspect how the stuff was being used. Um, for a while, in the kind of the thaw after the fall of the Soviet Union, people, Russian historians, very brave Russian historians, did begin investigating this, and they did a lot of research on it. And there was even, for a time, a lend museum commemorating the effort. That's now been closed down again. The archives are being closed down again, and lend is once again a deeply unpopular subject in Russia because they don't want to hear about it. Um, they didn't want to hear about it during the war either. I mean, the U.S. ambassador complained that they, uh, 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 this is Stanley, uh, in early 1943, that the Soviets weren't even thanking the United States for the aid. Um, now, as far as the amounts given, there you have all kinds of choices about the type of, of aid which either could or needed to be sent to the Soviets. You could even make the argument that, look, in 1941, 42, up to about Stalingrad, that a certain level of aid was both warranted, justified, um, on kind of both strategic and even to some extent moral terms, that the U.S. needed to keep the Soviets in the war. After Stalingrad, and particularly after the Kursk or, or, or Citadel, uh, uh, that is the Soviet uh, a kind of victory, uh, almost by exhaustion against the Germans in July 1943, now once the Germans are no longer on the, on the Eastern Front, the Soviets are in no, no danger of collapse. No compelling strategic argument uh, to give such a, a gargantuan level of, of lend lease aid to the Soviet Union. Again, not just in terms of finished products, the trucks, and the student bakers, and the jeeps, and the motorcycles, and the tanks, and warplanes, uh, but all the foodstuffs. Also, of course, all the industrial inputs, the aluminum, all the metals, the processed steel products, armor plate, um, uh, chrome, uh, stainless steel ball bearings, all kinds of an infinite of products, including even in, enriched uranium, which are being sent to the Soviets effectively free of charge, uh, rather than scale this down, curtail it in any sense, rather it gets ramped up to even more gargantuan levels from 1943 to 1945 when the Soviets are advancing on Berlin. There was no logic behind that. There was no reason that that policy needed to be carried out, at least to the extent that it was. Um, and that's where I think the policy really did kind of... Um, uh, it jumped the shark, as we might say, in kind of pop cultural terms. It just it, it took on this kind of life of its own that no longer had any any conceivable connection to uh, a compelling U.S. interest of any kind. Um, so there were always alternatives. Um, you know, when people say, "Oh, well, we had to give Lend-Lease aid," well, fine. Let's say we had to give some degree of Lend-Lease aid to the Soviets after Hitler invaded, but you could still determine what was going to be given. And, and they made those decisions and discussions vis-a-vis -vis other countries. For example, China was virtually cut off in 1943-1944. Why were, the, why were the, the Chinese shipments cut down to about 0.4 of 1% of Lend-Lease aid, whereas the Soviets were being ramped up again into the stratosphere? 
um, you know, what, what sort of moral argument is being made there? What strategic argument is being made there? Again, if, if there is one, it's a little mysterious to me. Do you believe that the Morgenthau plan uh, for post-hostilities um, uh, Germany was Soviet-inspired? Um, yes and no. I mean, clearly there, there, there was some Soviet influence, you know, simply because there were a lot of Soviet agents in the Treasury Department, uh, led by Dexter White, and it's no longer really even denied by, by most mainstream consensus historians that, in fact, he was answering regularly uh, to, to Soviet handlers. I mean, we know this now. Um, so there were Soviet agents in the Treasury. Uh, there were at least six or seven of them that had some kind of indirect influence over this, this document. But that said, Morgenthau himself, I think, clearly felt this way. It was quite clear that, um, you know, he felt that the Germans bore this this deep stain, this moral responsibility because of Holocaust, the ongoing mass murder of, of the European Jewry. As, as, as a Jew himself, he obviously felt that very cleanly. He wanted, uh, very keenly, he wanted to hold the Germans responsible. No, I think he was sincere in that sense. I don't think this was about um, skullduggery necessarily as far as Morgenthau's own role. Um, but that said, the broader question of uh, formulating U.S. policy uh, vis-a-vis the occupied countries, um, now there clearly was some Soviet influence involved. If you backtrack a little bit to unconditional surrender, now there again, I think it's, it's far more Roosevelt himself than it is Soviet influence as such, but rather there's a kind of an indirect sense in which the reason Roosevelt formulated that doctrine when he did, and then this actually plays out later both in Tehran and in the Morgenthau plan, was because he was desperate to convince Stalin that the U.S. was just as committed to kind of defeating and dismembering Nazi Germany as the Soviets were, at a time when admittedly the Soviets were, the Red Army was doing the vast bulk of, of the damage of the work against the Wehrmacht, and, and Roosevelt had a certain complex about it. Um, it's true, the Soviets weren't doing anything to help the U.S. against Japan, and Roosevelt did find that frustrating. Stalin would always just return the subject of the conversation to Germany and why were the Allies not opening a second front, why were they not fighting Germany? Um, and it was because uh, the Western Allies weren't yet to invade uh, continental Europe, at least uh, vis-a-vis uh, France, although they did invade, of course, Italy in 1943, uh, that he formulated unconditional surrender in January 1943. Uh, the Morgenthau plan, to some extent, was a natural outgrowth that unconditional surrender doctrine. It's just kind of ratcheting up you know, another level that the U.S. would not only insist on unconditional surrender from Germany, but that the U.S. would also deindustrialize Germany and turn Germany into effectively a kind of a, you know, a pre-19th century or maybe even um, uh, a pre uh, several millennia uh, agrarian state, kind of a pastoral state. There was all kinds of different, uh, different flavors of the language, but the idea was uh, to utterly deindustrialize Germany and, and, and force her back uh, to an earlier uh, phase of development. Um, now, I think that I think this doctrine, like unconditional surrender, was ultimately, while I understand where they were coming from, I think it was counterproductive in the sense it helped to prolong the war, to stiffen German uh, fighting morale, uh, to rule out any types of compromises from some of those German resistance figures involved in the assassination plots against Hitler. And there are all kinds of plots during the war, and maybe some of them are more or less serious than others. But in the end, uh, I think they were nearly all ruled out by the U.S. insistence on unconditional surrender and then on the Morgenthau plan. Uh, So there was some Soviet influence at hand there, and it was clearly a doctrine that the Soviets wanted the U.S. uh, to get behind, in part because it also kind of aided their own propaganda. They even got to pose themselves for a little while in full 1944 as the, as the less punitive power, despite Stalin's own plans not just to dismember Germany, but, but literally to deindustrialize East Germany in the sense of taking all the factory equipment and shipping it back to the Soviet Union. Um, so it was, it was effective propaganda from the Soviet perspective. But that's not to say the Soviets controlled the entire policy. I think a lot of it did come from Morgenthau and, frankly, from Roosevelt himself. I mean, Roosevelt signed off on it after all, even for clauses regarding the you know, the Germany wouldn't even be allowed like a winged glider after the war. So you would destroy the Air Force and you wouldn't allow them to have airplanes. That was actually Roosevelt's own contribution. So, uh, so it wasn't just Soviet influence. I think both Morgenthau and, and Roosevelt uh, themselves chimed in personally to give the, the Morgenthau plan its particularly vindictive uh, tone and flavor. Overall, how do you believe that FDR and Churchill come out of your narrative? Meaning, how would you rate their performances diplomatically and strategically? Well, it's interesting. Churchill, to me, is in many ways uh, the tragic figure of the war. Um, and this is something that, 
I discussed in a in a in an admittedly uh, somewhat provocative piece in the in the Spectator several months ago, looking at the ways in which, despite his reputation for being this arch imperialist, um, you know, again with all the kind of these days he gets accused of all, all manner of sins, um, uh, in fact uh, made a rather deliberate choice in 1941 to sacrifice imperial interests in order to to save the Soviet Union. Uh, most famously with the dispatch of those 200 Hawker Hurricane fighters, the pursuit planes, the workhorse of the RAF that had been pledged to defend, uh, defend Singapore, uh, uh, basically just giving them to, to Stalin free of charge. And later that year, a lot of other uh, war planes and tanks that helped out in the Battle of Moscow. In 1942, they even routed tanks from Middle Eastern Command, uh, leaving Egypt vulnerable to, to Rommel's Africa Corps uh, to help the Soviets of Stalingrad. Um, that said, Churchill had begun to wake up uh, to the nature of the Soviet threat in Europe, certainly by the time of the Tehran conflict in 1940. Three, he didn't have much luck in getting Roosevelt to see things his way, whether vis-a-vis -vis the so-called Mediterranean, actually Adriatic stratagem, that is, using the, the half million troops and 68 landing craft then in Italy, where the Allies had already landed and opened up bases and so on, uh, to possibly land troops in Adriatic and then, and then enter Europe by way of, of the Balkans. And a little bit later, when he puts up more of a fight over Poland, the percentage is agreeing, and I suppose at least he bails out Greece. He makes a little bit of a push to try to preserve a little bit of British influence um, elsewhere in Yugoslavia, Hungary, although without much luck. Um, so that in the end, Churchill's kind of just forced by by virtue of Britain's declining power and influence to accept an outcome with which he is not especially happy, while also going, we shouldn't forget, deeply in hoc to the United States. States, uh, both via Lend-Lease and then also via the so-called Phase Two Lend-Lease, effectively the loans at the end of the war, which um, you know, which really uh, put Britain in a in a relation of kind of being an economic vassal of the United States, as would, would be seen later, particularly in the Suez Crisis in 1956, when the British had to back down, in large part because of financial pressure from the Eisenhower administration. Uh, Roosevelt. What's so curious is there's a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde phenomenon going on with Roosevelt in the war. He drives an extremely hard bargain with the British, um, all the way back in 1940 with the so-called Bases for Destroyers deal, where, where Britain turns over most of her key uh, bases and, and installations in the Western Hemisphere in exchange for 50 mostly decrepit World War I vintage destroyers. Uh, then in the terms of the Lend Lease Aid, uh, all the other loans given to Britain during the war, and, and some of this, to be fair to Roosevelt, went back to the British default. Um, earlier in the 1930s, which uh, effectively meant that the U.S., even in legal terms, um, uh, its hands were tied uh, regarding uh, loans and other consignments to Britain in 1939 and 1940. But that said, the fact that Roosevelt drove such a brutally hard bargain with Churchill and with the British raises the question of why he didn't drive any bargain at all with Stalin. He effectively gave Stalin everything he wanted for free uh, at, at Tehran. As well. Okay, technically not for free. The Soviets settled for about two tenths of 1951, um, but virtually free with no payment up front. Um, why, as early as Tehran, uh, Roosevelt signed off not simply on Stalin being able to rearrange the borders of Poland to his liking, uh, being able to absorb the three Baltic states, effectively having a free hand in Eastern Europe. Why? At Tehran, and this is to me one of the most astonishing things at all. I mean, there, there, there was one review of, of my book in uh, the Guardian uh, by Serhi of Harvard, which, which was, was mostly, I thought, a very sober and fair review. Um, but he made this counter argument um, where he said that, look, in the end, Roosevelt only gave Stalin what was already in Stalin's power, effectively, uh, to have on his own. Um, and again, I think this is actually untrue even in Eastern Europe, where most of the territories were assigned to Stalin when the Red Army was still blundering about in Ukraine, um, uh, about 600 miles and more from the Soviet border at the time of of Tehran across most of Eastern. But it's even more true in Asia, where Roosevelt, in a kind of secret agreement, left out of the conference protocol, the Eureka Protocol, because because it was Stalin still had a neutrality pact with Japan and didn't want it published. But he effectively gave a secret agreement to Stalin that he would assign Stalin a sphere of influence in Asia, including Manchuria, which is what supposedly the Sino-Japanese War was all about. Um, along with, of course, Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, he later updated that to include a uh, share in the in a uh, share in Korea uh, at Yalta. But as early as Tehran, when Stalin is still you know, nearly two years, and in fact, no one knew if he would ever 
uh, turn around and aid the United States against Japan. It's at a time when not only is he not helping the U.S. against Japan, they're literally arresting hundreds of U.S. pilots who were crash landing on Soviet soil after bombing raids on Japan. So Roosevelt assigns Stalin a humongous sphere of influence in Northern Asia at a time when Stalin is, is not just neutral, effectively he is loyal to Japan. Um, so I, I don't know how you could describe that as uh, uh, a short-sighted at best, uh, if not utterly disastrous policy. Um, you know, so that vis-a-vis Eastern Europe and, and Northern Asia, I, I think Roosevelt exerted no leverage at all, despite in fact having all kinds of leverage that he could have uh, brought to bear on those questions. So, yeah, in diplomatic terms, vis-a-vis the Soviets, I, I would certainly rate Roosevelt, I think, a, a failure. Um, vis-a-vis the, the British, um, you know, maybe this was for the best, maybe it wasn't, but the U.S. effectively had kind of taken over the British Empire in a sort of financial receivership by the end of the war. Vis-a-vis the British, I think Roosevelt was quite effective. Um, that's not normally what he's giving credit for, though, but I think you're, you're sort of mainstream historians of the war. Uh, he certainly did put the screws to the British Empire, though, and, they, and I suppose he deserves uh, some credit for that, if credit is the right word. If you wanted people to take one thing away from your book, what would it be? Well, I keep coming back to this idea that uh, you were asking this when, when it came to some of these historians saying there was no alternative to Lenin or something like that, but there are always alternatives. Uh, that there are always different possible outcomes um, and that the decisions of statesmen uh, matter a great deal. Um, I do think there's a bit of uh, complacency in the way the war is remembered in the West, uh, the idea of this good war, obviously the defeat of Nazi Germany and ending the Holocaust. We can see why uh, people celebrate 1945, the E-Day, that they brought an end to this evil regime. I think, though, that People have never, quite, people in the West have never quite understood that 1945 meant something very different in a lot of the world. The world between, again, kind of roughly Berlin and Beijing, um, where certainly there, there were people who, who believed in the communist cause, so they weren't all unhappy with the way that it turned out. But you had a lot of people who were subject not just to um, either a hostile Soviet military occupation, um, but to many more years of, of civil war. Uh, China being a conspicuous case. Poland uh, was a civil war, but in some ways it was a kind of war of occupation against what, what remained of the Polish Home Army. The Baltic states, Ukraine, continued to see uh, varieties of, of guerrilla warfare and, and low-boil kind of partisan warfare for another four or five years. Uh, massive, of course, economic hardship, devastation, uh, the Soviet um, uh, deportation of millions of prisoners of war to forced labor camps. The story didn't really have a happy ending in those parts of the world. And, and so I do think that in the end, uh, the decision made not just by Stalin, but by um, uh, by the Western powers, and particularly Roosevelt and Churchill. I mean, those decisions had consequences. And, and so while we celebrate the victory, um, uh, I think we should also uh, spare some thought uh, for the victims and those for whom uh, the war did not turn out so well as it did uh, for the Americans and the British. On that observation, of which I would like to agree with entirely, I would like to thank you very much, Professor McMeekin, for being so kind as to speak with us today. This is Charles Cotillo. Thanks for listening to New Books in History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for having me on, Charles.